Well, good morning, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming this morning. And uh, Director Doring, thank you very much for the nice invitation and to the Friedrich Nauman Stiftung for the invitation to cross the Atlantic and return to Berlin, one of my favorite places on the planet. Always a pleasure to be here, um, but not necessarily in the rainy time of year, as we've been let yesterday anyway. Um, but really, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be um, invited to this important symposium. Very interesting topics you have um, laid out for discussion, and I want to leave as much time for discussion as possible. Um, these are big, big questions you, you pose. Um, does authoritarian capitalism work? Well, there's a pretty simple answer to that. Yes is the answer. How does it work, I think, is the next question you've posed. It's not a simple answer to that. Um, in fact, I do not have an answer to that, but we I will hopefully in my comments this morning <coughs> stimulate uh, some discussion about that. Um, and I will try and give you, uh, in sort of 15 <coughs> minutes or so, because I want to leave as much time for, for a discussion as possible, I'll try and give you, um, or I've been asked to give an overview of the state of the Chinese political system uh, today, which is no small task in itself, and where it is going from here. That's an even more difficult task. You mentioned predictions. <laughs> we have a um, person in the United States that you might have probably not heard of. He used to be an American baseball player and coach named Yogi Berra. And Yogi, Yogi Berra was known for uh, his ability to have these sort of short, sharp um, commentaries and aphorisms, one of which was, um, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> so, um, very insightful. So all, all psychologists, at least, um, should bear that in mind and take that to heart. Trying to predict uh, China's future has uh, uh, been a very difficult thing for a very long time. And the, historical landscape is littered with um, sinologists and their predictions who have not predicted the trajectory of that country, right? Just when you think it's stable, it's actually very unstable. When it looks unstable, it's actually perhaps more stable. So um, China, what I'm going to give you this morning is sort of a snapshot of where China is today, as, as I see it, um, and really where it's come in the last year. Uh, why the last year? Because just about uh, exactly a year ago, the third week of November last year, they had a major leadership change in that country, you may remember, uh, called the 18th Party Congress. And um, it brought to power a new generation of leaders and new senior leaders, um, a number of new faces. There was a rather dramatic a turnover. So I'm going to start with that. Um, event and then talk about what we've seen from this new leadership over the last 12 months and where where it might be going um, into the future. So, so if you think back 12 months ago um, and they held this Congress, which they do every five years in rather traditional Chinese Communist tradition, which uh, is a tradition of secrecy, first of all, no transparency, no accountability. Um, no um, discussions uh, in public about uh, who was going to be promoted, to what positions, how they were to make the Politburo or the, or the Central Committee or anything. So here we are in the second decade of the 21st century, and the Chinese leadership operates very much the way the Bolshevik leadership operated a century ago uh, in the early Soviet Union. And um, actually, when I was asked to to attend this conference and present this paper, um, um, I was asked you know, to explain how does the Chinese political system work. And my initial reaction was, if you understand the GDR, you understand the People's Republic of China. And I'm not I'm being very serious there. China, don't forget, is a Leninist, authoritarian, communist system. Full stop. Beyond that, it has other characteristics. Authoritarian capitalism, you might call it. Their economy is certainly not a Leninist, classic Leninist system. It's a very hybrid uh, system. It has bits and pieces from uh, 
certainly from the Soviet command economy, from its own experience in the last, since 1949, and from various things it's borrowed from abroad. So it's a, it's a hybrid. But the political system, um, every bit like the GDR, every bit, every bit like the Soviet Union. Uh, it has not uh, changed fundamentally um, in 60 years. Around the edges of this change, and one of the things that has changed is, in fact, leadership transition. Um, and that is one of the principal lessons that the Chinese communists learned from the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Chinese communists, I should say, um, have spent enormous amounts of time in uh, studying the causes of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the GDR and other former um, communist party states in Eastern Europe. They've, uh, they still do it. And they, even right now, uh, there is a 12-part documentary that is being required for viewing of all party members in China at this very moment, November 2013. They're all having to watch it. They're all being called to meetings to view this documentary about why the Soviet Union collapsed and how we are going to avoid the same future. So the Soviet uh, example, um, <laughs> including the collapse part of that example, is still very present in the Chinese Communist worldview. I'll come back to that point in a moment. But leadership transition is one thing they learned, they think they learned, from the Soviet collapse. Soviet leaders, of course, did not retire. You either you died in office or you were purged from office. There were only two paths out of that system. Um, so there was no regular rotation. And, and beginning with Deng Xiaoping in the um, 19... Uh, 80s instituted this uh, system of regularized every 10 years, really, uh, turnover of, of leaders. So last year at the 18th Party Congress, um, they had this large turnover. Um, but the fact that it uh, took place um, without any uh, real transparency and that there was significant factionalism behind the scenes, manipulation by retired former leaders, Chiang Zemin in particular, uh, really shows that the system had not really fully institutionalized. It, the Chinese political system remains unaccountable and I think very immature on a number of levels. Um, nonetheless, it brought into power um, a new leadership. Two-thirds of the leadership changed last November. A um, few characteristics of the new leadership, they're younger than the previous one. Average age 61. Uh, they're better educated than the previous one. 19 of the 25 members of the Politburo today um, in China have university degrees. One has a military degree, and five have degrees from the Central Party School. Um, so they all have degrees. Uh, contrast that, for example, 30 years ago, the 1982 Politburo, none, not a single one, had a university degree. So that's a kind of characteristic that's become more and more apparent over the last two decades. Um, there are more leaders this time from the interior of the country, or previously they were predominantly from the coastal regions of the country. Um, and uh, two other characteristics. This new group um, is what we call the Cultural Revolution Generation. These are people who were teenagers um, during the Cultural Revolution in the late 1960s, and in many cases were sent to the countryside uh, for up to 10 years. That includes the new president, Xi Jinping himself, who spent eight years in Shaanxi province, in a remote village. And those years in the countryside had a real significant effect on this generation of leaders. Um, and secondly, uh, we've seen this new leadership contrasted with the previous two leaderships a slight decline in what we call technocrat, uh, technocratism. Uh, the previous two leaderships were filled almost exclusively with engineers, you know, hydroelectric engineers, electrical engineers, hydro, you know, hydrology engineers, different types of engineers, um, predominantly of that educational background. The new group has slightly more diversified uh, educational background with some leaders School of Economics, some of Social Sciences, some of Law, Journalism, and even the Humanities. <clears throat> so this is a bit more diversified leadership. Um, so what have 
they've been in power a year now, almost a year. So what can we say about this past year? What signs have we seen? Um, and what indications do they give uh, for, the, for the future? Well, first it has to be said, said that the group that stepped down a year ago, the former leadership under Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, are pretty widely seen to um, have not been very competent. That China um, stagnated uh, during the second <coughs> five years of their term. Although many Chinese speak of their term in office now as what they call the 10 lost years. Now you may think, lost years? China was growing like a most rapidly growing economy on the planet for the last 10 years. Professor Shambaugh, what are you talking about? Well, it's not my judgment, it's Chinese judgment. They think that many problems in China festered and got worse and worse and worse during those 10 years, most notably corruption and social inequalities. Um, and thirdly, policy uh, sclerosis is the word I would use. They froze up from 2009 onwards um, for various reasons, but we, have, we did not see the government and the party taking any new initiatives post-2009. Part of that was due to the looming leadership transition. They didn't, part of it was due to factionalism. Um, part of it was due to deep disagreement as to what kind of reforms to undertake. Those disagreements still exist, by the way. Um, the party leadership, I think, and most people in China are agreed that the country needs radical reforms. I'll explain in a minute what those need to be. Um, so there's a kind of consensus that, that China has reached a turning point, or maybe a point of diminishing returns, where the policies of the last 30 years, which have been so successful economically at least, have sort of run their course. And it's not that they're um, not producing anything anymore, but they've reached a point of diminishing returns. The question is what kind of reforms need to be adopted and implemented to move the country forward uh, qualitatively. And there's deep disagreement about that. Um, so for these reasons, we've had kind of policy sclerosis for the last three or four years. And in the first year in office so far, they have not taken, um, undertaken hardly any new reforms. Uh, a couple of things they've done <clears throat> slightly differently. I mean, Xi Jinping himself, as a leader, has a well, he has a personality. His, his predecessor, Hu Jintao, uh, did not have much of a personality. A very wooden individual. Um, no charisma. Uh, wasn't comfortable uh, in public. Wasn't comfortable even in private. <laughs> you know, he didn't have. He was a very wooden kind of apparatchik if you know that term, in the Soviet period. Um, Xi Jinping, on the other hand, much more comfortable, personally, much more self-confident, even somewhat charismatic. He's got a beautiful wife. She, she's now, we never saw Hu Jintao's wife. We never saw Hu Jintao's children. Now we, Hung Li, that is her name, Xi Jinping's wife, she traveled with him. She's quite glamorous, former military singer, dresses very stylishly. This is a kind of new style for a Chinese communist leader. And um, he, uh, so in addition to style, he has uh, made his mark so far um, trying to uh, crack down on corruption. He knows that the system is riddled with corruption, and he knows that there's enormous popular discontent with corruption uh, in China today. If you ask any Chinese citizen, what is the number one problem in China today, they will answer corruption. <laughs> without thinking. Um, it's very serious. And they know, the party knows, and the party says explicitly, if we do not get on top of this corruption problem, uh, it will be the end of the party. They say that. Johnson Min said that, Hu Jintao said that, Xi Jinping has said that. All three of them have said that publicly. They know um, that it is a potentially regime ender <coughs> if they don't get on top of it. So he's made some moves to do so, um, which we can go into if you're interested. Um, but so far, uh, they're more, I would say, kind of symbolic than, than substantive. Um, another thing that's happened during this year is the trial of Bo Xi Lai, you probably read about, the former leader who was uh, accused, of, accused and now convicted of embezzlement, bribe taking, and the abuse of power, and sentenced to life in prison. 
um, actually a death, suspended death sentence, life in prison. Um, uh, his wife also spending life in prison for her role in murdering the British businessman. Uh, but that was a major scandal hanging over the political system and over Xi Jinping, and they have managed to put that behind them. And they had a trial in September, relatively open trial for the Chinese system. And it was actually real-time reporting from inside the courtroom. Of course, no foreigners or no, no media or anybody even allowed into the courtroom, but they had um, social media uh, broadcast from the courtroom. Okay, so Bo Lai problem put to rest, um, and the, uh, the real centerpiece of what Xi Jinping has tried to do in his first year, rhetorically at least, is what he calls the China dream. You know, the Chinese political system is noted for a number of things, one of which is slogans, what they call kohao in Chinese. Um, just political slogans, one after another, after another, year after year after year, decade after decade after decade, and every new leader has to have his or her, it's always his, sorry, they're not her leaders in China, um, his new slogan. And so the last guy, his slogan was the harmonious society. The new guy, Xi Jinping, um, replaced that with the China dream, Zhu Meng. And it's a little unclear still what he means by the China dream, but He's identified a couple elements of it. One is that Chinese society should become more equitable um, and more communitarian. In that, in that manner, it's no different from Hu Jintao's view of the what he called the harmonious society. Uh, the second element of the China dream is what's known as the great renaissance of the Chinese nation, the Zhuguo Dafuxing, it's called, uh, which is a notion that China will regain its central place in the world order, and that all Chinese will live with dignity and have a comfortable life. And then there's a third element that has been apparent in Xi Jinping's China dream. Excuse me, it's a harder nationalistic kind of element in which uh, China has been subjected to what they call a century of shame and humiliation, and it is never again going to be subjected to that, it's going to overcome it, and it's going to be uh, staunchly na nationalistic and stand up for China's sovereignty. Um, what does that mean? Well, that means, uh, in the case of Japan, a much tougher policy on maritime disputes. The same with the South China Sea and the Southeast Asian countries. And we have seen a much tougher um, Chinese stance on those disputes in the last year. Xi Jinping has also been uh, visiting military facilities a lot in the first year um, and giving very tough speeches. And if you read these speeches, uh, they frequently say, quote, you must be prepared to fight and win wars, unquote. He has said this several times. His predecessors didn't say that. To fight and win wars, he tells the troops. Um, and he calls for the military, well, he, he calls for what he calls for rich nation and strong military. So there is a more kind of militaristic, nationalistic uh, dimension to his China dream that was not apparent uh, rhetorically uh, with the pre previous government. And then the last thing that we can say about the first year of the new leadership is that there has been no movement, no forward movement, Actually, there has been backward movement on political reform. Um, this guy is even more conservative than Hu Jintao was. Um, there has been a serious, more significant crackdown on dissent, arrests, uh, human rights abuses, detentions, crackdown on the social media, arrests of uh, business people now, um, and various others. Uh, so this is, a, we've seen a very dark period in the last year, politically, in China. Um, and it wasn't exactly light before the previous year. <laughs> so it's, as I said, there's been retrogression uh, over the last year, not stagnation. They've gone backward. Um, and there's no sign that they want to institute any political reforms. So Xi Jinping is not, for those who thought he might be a closet Gorbachev, uh, forget it. In fact, he'd been in office one month, and he gave a speech, in which was a blistering 
critique of Gorbachev's reforms. Um, and he argued, quote, um, uh, why must we stand firm on the party's leadership over the military? Because that's the lesson from the collapse of the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, where the military was depoliticized, separated from the party, and nationalized, the party was disarmed, unquote. So uh, that's just another lesson they learned from the intensive study of the Soviet Union. You've got to maintain uh, strict control over your security services and your military because they have to fight for you and save you in the end. Um, so, so he's, he's um, Xi Jinping is not uh, a political reformer, at least. And without political reform, I would argue, they're going to have a number of impediments to further economic reform. Uh, you mentioned the issue of innovation, and we were discussing that at, at dinner last night. Innovation is um, a centerpiece of where the uh, government is trying to go in terms of the economic program. Um, we're going to learn, by the way, a lot more about the economic reforms and the economic program this coming weekend. Uh, Saturday through Monday, they are having what they call the third plenary session of the 18th Central Committee. A very significant meeting. Third plenary sessions always are devoted to economic reform. Fourth plenary sessions, which will take place in September of next year, are devoted to political issues, so um, that's the one I'm really waiting for, but I'm not expecting much from. But this weekend, a lot of people inside and outside of China are expecting a lot, and the Chinese government's done nothing to damp down those expectations. Quite to the contrary, they, they announced just a couple, two days ago, um, that there's going to be sweeping, widespread, systematic uh, reforms in various sectors. So get ready, maybe. Uh, we will see what, what those are. But at the heart of, um, of these reforms is an attempt to reorient the overall growth model of the country <clears throat> from the one that has existed for the last 30 years and has been very successful for the country, um, has produced the world's fastest modernization in, in world history um, based on domestic investment, largely into infrastructure, plus exports. Right? We're all familiar with that. But that has reached diminishing returns. And so the government wants to transition to a new model based on domestic consumption and innovation to build a so-called knowledge economy. Um, that's been the policy really for the last three years, but we have seen no more than rhetoric about it. No resources have, have been allocated to this reoriented growth model. So we'll find out a little bit more this weekend about whether they're going to put their money where their mouth is. Americans would say. <laughs> and, um, but it's going to take more than money. It's going to take structural reform, significant fundamental structural reform of financial services and property, educational system, um, the state owned enterprise system, um, and a variety of public goods uh, to make this transition. And part of the problem is that the Big, many sectors of the economy, significant sectors, are still in the state sector. So I said at the beginning, this is a hybrid economy. Uh, but 40% of GDP in that country is still in the state sector. So what does that mean? That means it's owned by the state, managed by the state, um, and it's not privatized. And what are these sectors? Well, they include um, some pretty significant ones. Uh, energy sector. Um, aerospace, defense sector, financial sector, the banking sector, trans different parts of the transportation sector, uh, trains, for example, um, uh, telecommunications sector, and uh, the state-owned enterprises themselves, of which there are still 145,000 in China. 145,000 so-called SOEs, state-owned enterprises. Uh, which have a complete stranglehold, monopoly. You ask about authoritarian capitalism, this is authoritarian capitalism. In fact, this is what Lenin, if you remember, wrote about in 1917 in his thesis on imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. How many of you have read that? Really? And my students, I asked them that question, they, nobody raises their hand, and I can understand because they're all under the age of 30, but in this audience, even none of you have read 
Lenin's thesis on imperialism? Oh, you should. Uh, so in that, he argues that um, what he called state monopoly capitalism had taken control of the capitalist world. In Chinese. Well, China today is the prime example of state monopoly capitalism. State capitalism, that's what they have um, in this 40% of the sector. 60% of, of the economy is a mixture of collective and private. 20% collective and, and about 40% private now. But don't forget the 40% is still in the state. And of these 145,000 SOEs, um, 120 of them are so-called national champion firms, huge vertically integrated uh, conglomerates that dominate the economy. Well, if, if they're going to introduce um, competition, if they're going to create an innovation society, they're going to have to uh, introduce competition into these sectors and break up and dismantle these SOEs. It's no secret. Everybody knows it. Um, but when's the last time in history that you know of when people who had uh, monopoly interests and were getting very rich from it voluntarily gave up those interests? Never. So there, even if we find out this weekend that um, they're ready to tackle uh, these reforms in these areas um, that I just mentioned, uh, financial services, banking, defense, aerospace, telecoms and transportation, uh, they're going to meet a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance. China may not be a democracy, it's no democracy, but it definitely has bureaucratic politics and vested interests, big vested interests, and they're going to push back against attempts to uh, reform, dismantle, reshape uh, those industries. So that's going to be um, one problem. And then there are going to be three other, I would argue, just to close, almost finish, um, three other sources of resistance, you might say. Um, first is the, the Communist Party itself, right? They have a monopoly on political power. They have a monopoly on financial power. They have a monopoly on a lot of things, and they don't want to lose power. It's all about power. So they're not about to cede power to uh, society. So those of you who, want, who think that civil society is going to blossom in China tomorrow, forget it. Media going to blossom in China tomorrow, forget it. Human rights going to blossom in China tomorrow, forget it. They're not going to do it. Um, so that's the second big source of um, resistance to real reform. Um, and uh, there are others we can, we can go into. The propaganda system is a big part of that, too, I would argue. They still have a monopoly over the media, over information, over the internet. So I say, if you understand the GDR, you understand the People's Republic of China. Um, so this is still, you know, you understand the Stasi, you understand the Guoja Antren Bu in Chinese. The Guoja Antren Bu dwarfs the Stasi. You have no idea. The Stasi is one-tenth the size of the Guoja Antren Bu. State Ministry of State Security in China. So uh, don't forget that we are dealing here with a major security state, you might say. Now, the society in China is not regulated the way the GDR was. It's much more open. People travel abroad. There is no wall, you know. Um, and there is a there's fairly fairly free discourse, believe it or not, within boundaries within boundaries, but they're not about to really uh, radically reform the system. Even though they know that some changes are needed, they're afraid that they're going to lose control. If they start down the path of political reform, it will cascade out of their control. And they'll lose control, as was the case under Gorbachev, and then the whole thing will come crashing down. So as I say, when they wake up in the morning and they go to sleep at night, what do they think of first? The Soviet Union. I'm serious. They're really petrified about that. And then, if the Soviet collapse isn't enough, they look at the color revolutions in Central Asia. They look at the Arab Spring. They look at the democratization throughout East Asia over the last 15 to 20 years in Latin America. And they look at the trend of history. They know that uh, democracy is on the rise and authoritarian states are on the 
on decline. They're one of four Communist Party states left on the planet today. Laos, Vietnam, Cuba, China. Um, and they want to uh, stay in power. So they're not about to uh, voluntarily um, see power, okay? So um, I don't expect any, there may be some, re some rhetorical reforms announced this weekend, and I, I hope that they're serious, you know, but they're going to be um, blocked, I would predict, um, in their implementation. So let me just close then uh, with asking a couple of questions couple of things to keep our eye on in the, in the future. And those, first of all, who study Chinese uh, history know that there are a number of features of the current Chinese regime that are similar to the uh, declining stages of previous Chinese regimes in the imperial era, in the nationalist era. And one has to at least ask the question, is this regime entering into its end game? Um, is it actually in decline? It may look very strong on the surface. The economy three, and $3.9 trillion in foreign exchange and all these things we read about in the newspaper every day, very impressive, but is it um, uh, sort of hollow on the inside? Does the emperor have clothes or no clothes? Um, many analysts uh, argue that the emperor's clothes are, um, are revealing these days, that there's a lot of intense corruption, systematic, throughout the whole system, not just the party, but the whole country, whole economy. Inequality, worse than any country on Earth. The Gini coefficient, the measure of inequality, highest in China than anywhere else, including Brazil, which has now surpassed Brazil. So the haves up here, about the 10%, and then the sort of haves, they're about 40%, and then the 40% of have-nots. A lot of people um, have not gotten ahead. This is a highly stratified society, highly frustrated society, very unequal society. Uh, social welfare not being provided to society. Uh, so called public goods. This is an increasingly restive society. Demonstrations, 125,000 large scale demonstrations per year um, in China. These are official statistics. <laughs> you can imagine that they're, they understate probably. Ethnic unrest, you know, Tibetans burning themselves to death on an almost weekly basis. You know, Uyghurs in Xinjiang province just last week, another uprising. And then they drove a, uh, a car into Tiananmen Square that ignited this last week. There's a lot of ethnic unrest in China. Um, Overtaxation, uh, lots of things that um, if you're an analyst of Chinese history and declining regimes, you look at it and say, hmm, uh, that, that was present just before the Qing Dynasty fell. Hmm. That was present just before Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists fell. Hmm. That's present today. Are the Communists going to fall? <clears throat> I'm not predicting the Communists are going to fall. They have a lot of strengths. Not the least of which is, as Xi Jinping himself said, the military. They've used it before. They have killed people to stay in power. I am here to tell you they will do it again if they have to. It's not a very nice prospect, but they will do it again. Um, so last thing to keep your eye on, there are two, two things I would note. First of all is the Chinese elite. Many people have gotten very wealthy in this, uh, China has more millionaires and billionaires than any country on earth today. Well, what are these wealthy people, not just the millionaires and billionaires, but the 20%, the where are their assets? Answer, abroad, outside the country. They all have foreign bank accounts, foreign property, um, their, rel their children are going to foreign universities. Um, they would have a foreign passport if their government allowed dual nationality, but they don't. So they have one foot out the door. They're ready to bolt at a moment's notice. As soon as the regime begins to crumble, they're gone. So in any, in any system, I would argue, if you're elite, particularly if the elite has benefited so well as they have over the last 30 years, if you're elite, have one foot out the door, Free to leave. That tells you a lot about this, the instability of the system. That's the first thing I would note. The last thing I'll note and keep an eye on are um, the institutions responsible for enforcing one party rule and maintaining the facade of legitimacy. Right? I don't have to tell you 
those of you who uh, knew the GDR and other former communist states in Eastern Europe, when the guardians of the party state, the censors and the propaganda authorities, the internal security services, the military, the keepers of state secrets, the intelligentsia, when they stop enforcing the party state's uh, writ, become a little lax in enforcing the party's control over society, then the facade begins to crack rather quickly. I'm sure you've seen this film, <coughs> Das Leben in Anderen, right, about the Stasi agent who began to sympathize with the people he was monitoring. Um, excellent movie. Uh, well, when those people begin to sympathize with the people they're monitoring, then the system is finished. Now, in China, we don't have any indications of that happening yet. I haven't, I haven't seen this yet. I'm just saying we have to keep our eye on it. Because once the censors uh, stop censoring, censors have a, have a really difficult problem in China today. Why? The internet, social media. It's one thing to control newspapers and radio broadcasts, but controlling social media and 400 million people who are online, this is not easy. So um, even if they, <laughs> so I'm saying that uh, they haven't begun to crack yet, these guardians of the state. But I'm just sort of, you know, tagging that to something to keep our eye on. When these guardians of the Communist Party states stop guarding, then we know that the end game has begun. <laughs>